<laughs> I've never seen anything like this before.
They come. Uh, blade and spear, shield and stone. Two arms. They come. They, uh, I. Uh, what a pack so dead. A terrible wonder, even for one who has seen many wonders. If its kind walk Yesha foreigner, then surely the wheel of the world is set to turn again. Perhaps. Perhaps it will grind me at last. Pain? No. Outweighs peace in the measure of my days. God murderer. Traveler tried once. She came upon me at first light, when the dew had not yet fallen from the grass. A carpenter, and daughter of a carpenter who was a carpenter's son. The branches took her at once. I wonder if her saw is still clenched within her fair hand. How came I to this wretched state? <sighs> its eyes reached the question. Before its tongue left home or hearth, the tumbling ruin beneath its tender pads was once a fortification, an encircling bulwark to the greatest conurbation ever brought forth on Yesha's soil. Such faith we put in its solidity. Merchant and marshal, peasant and prince, their souls kneeled at the altar of within and without. But a wall is a false god, built to crumble. The only 
thing a wall ever truly divides. The fool, from his wisdom, the rifts open swiftly. They split the bulwark stone as a hot needle kisses the onion skin of a boil, and the pus poured through on tangled wooden limbs. Yes, the final calamity. Their numbers, endless. They rushed upon us like a river in flood. The end began. Ah, teeming with life. The sun has never shone on a city greater, ruined. So that I might not even visit it in dreams, charnel. By the root. Yes, the final calamity. Their numbers, endless. They rushed upon us like a river in flood. The end began. For forty days, we fought them on these steps. The soldiers fell first, then the officers, then they called upon the priests. We knew the children would be next, and so we flung our very bodies into the breach. Some were torn apart like green shoots in a glutton's teeth, others were swallowed whole and vanished from the sphere. I stuck, anguished cork in a malign bottle. It seethes around me. It waits to disgorge its grotesqueness once more upon Yesha's scalded skin. Please, Paxlotek, wanderer, it who would do right, put its edge to this cursed snarl. Vent its rage upon it. I shall greet death as an old friend, and we shall go hand in hand to the horizon, leaving the suffering of this blasted heath far behind. Destroy the knot. Am I? Uh, uh, is this real? 
Or, as insensate madness claimed me, Paxaltec. I have not tasted air mixed with the foul humors of the tango in an age's age, nor did I dream that I ever might again, much less feel the soft touch of good soil beneath my hooves, or the kiss of the wind on my free fur. Faithless, faithless have I been, and yet Axaltec came with war in its right hand, and temperance in its left, the Paxaltec came, and I am saved. Two-handed warrior, it has my allegiance, whatever may come. Paxaltec have a gift for death, this much is true, but they are not all destroyers. Perhaps if it fights with us, perhaps the root may yet be crushed under the wheel of time. Take this, though it be a relic of Wilhelmer, stewards of death. Wield it in defense of life. No thanks is needed, for I owe it a debt unpayable. <laughs> I think I shall linger here a while yet. Many are those who fell on these blood-soaked steps. No, some are now not but bones. They each deserve the funerary rites of royalty. These I shall endeavor to complete with whatever time is left to me. If its road should ever wind this way again, grace me with a visit. There are yet tales of Yesha I might tell it, if it cares to hear them shared. On the contrary, <laughs> it has been ages since I felt so very much alive. Ah, uh, let us first be properly introduced. Uh, once I was called Lich, foremost of the labor. Hmm? Uh, I priest of the dead. How I gloried in that title. Would that I had known the irony. A funerary priest of the deathless, the highborn, hmm? one who wraps the powerful in glory, and the Muslim who seals the secrets of the eternal empress with sweet seed oil and with night sap. We guarded the flesh of the great and sought their resurrection among his trusted sacred pan. I was the utmost. Uh, I relish the favor of her permanence. More fool I. For many epochs, the highborn did not fear the flow of time, for the fruit of the Thane tree kept it at bay. But there are other ways to die. Misadventure. <sighs> the Eternal Empress dreamed of defeating this final terminus. If life could be taken, could it not be given back? The flesh was preserved against that question's answer. This was the province of the Lamir. But. Let us start at the beginning, hmm? Much would I have it know, and to know all, it must know what is first. Would it hear the history of the pan? In the time before time, the pan lived in the place that was. It is said that there came a great plague that ravaged the land so that the fields were seeded only with the bones of the dead and yielded only the cries of the bereft. With his flock drowning in woe, the leader of the pan held forth a great decree. One hundred ships were built to hold 
10,000 souls, with their god of many faces cutting the waves before them. The pan that were ventured across the Vilkmarza, the dark sea, through the long night. The vaunts prayed and the red widows wept, for no one knew if the dark sea had a far shore. One hundred days lit the hundred ships, and one hundred nights drew their swaddling across them too. But on the hundred first day, as the Red Widow in the foremost ship bowed her horns to the god of many faces, a bird lit between them, singing, Glory to the Pan, for they have reached the Kin Mother. Yesha rose like the dawn before them, unseen, untamed, and free. The king who was, him known to the pan as Kolked the War Handed, later Kolked the War Begone, and at last as Kolked the Wise. Quick of blade was he in his youth, a fearsome general who watered the tree of progress with the lifeblood of many enemies. But the exploits of youth brought Kolket no peace in age. They say he took the plague as fate's judgment against his warlike eye. Fate offered a choice, flee the land of his fathers or end his line as the King of Death. Kolkett hesitated no more in pilgrimage than he had in war. He raised up ships as once he had raised regiments. He sailed from the place that was with a heart full of hope. He was never to see Asia's shores. He passed in peace before the crossing's end, greeting death with grace. The god of many faces had been with the pan since the place that was longer. None speak of a time before its guardianship. It was a god as real as the soil beneath us. A god one could visit, a god one could touch. Its ways were not known, but all agreed it loved us and ever would. More would I have it here of this, for this tendril twines with its own. <sighs> but patience to hand it one, each thing in time. In those days, there was no empress. There were no queens. Kolket the Wise passed on the Dark Sea and left no heir. It was only agreed that the clergy should step in where Kolket had stood. The Vaughns spoke for the Many-Faced One, and the Red Widows spoke for the Sun, Stone, Sky, and Stream. It had been ever thus. Now. They linked hands to cradle the destiny of the Pan. For eighty days, the Vaughns fell prostrate upon Yesha's unfamiliar shore. Mm. They prayed for a sign that our searching was over, and that this forest should be ours. On the eightieth day, two forms emerged from the depths of the jungle. First came a doe with coat of red. Where it walked, the soil gave forth flowers and sweet berries, and they took it as a sign of grace. But behind the doe came another, a wolf with fur as lightless as the obsidian waves the pan had so lately crossed. Surely, this great beast was a portent of death. Yet, 
desperate were these threadbare priests of old, and of these visions to their charges, these fonts spoke only one. And why not? The dove fills all who glimpse it with a spirit of hope and a sense of growth. It leaps among the shrub and bramble even now, even with the Asia sundered by the root. There are those who think it more than a spirit, a god in waiting. These call themselves the children of the Red Doe. The carpenter's daughter was one such. Huh. May her faith be rewarded. May her spirit roam the forest alongside the Doe forever free. Those who glimpse the Doe often glimpse the wolf, for the latter seems compelled to pursue the former. Yeah, yeah, to hear those early Vaughns tell it would be to hear of many different wolves in pursuit, and only one though. A simple deception, but a far-reaching one. Modern Pan know the truth. What must it be to spend an eternity chasing that which one might catch but may not kill? For the wolf and the doe have often met antler and tooth. Hoof and claw. <laughs> the doe may spill the wolf's blood, and the wolf may taste the doe's flesh, but never the other's life to take. Yesha itself forbids it. They say the chase has driven the wolf quite mad. With the assurance of the Vaughns, the Pan took to Yesha and she to us. And for a time, there was stillness. Pan were born who had never known the land that was, nor the endless sea at their backs. One such was called Genus. She was but 15 springs when she felt the calling of the Red Widows. And not three more when she felt the touch of sickness. <sighs> As Genus approached the door of death, she sought her sisters, for there were no Lamer yet, and it was the Red Widows who ushered the pan into the soil. But Genus's malady was known to the Widow Mother, to her, to the Elder Pan. It seemed the plague had found them again, even on this distant shore. Genus was shunned cast out into the jungle, and her name was forbidden from Pan lips. None among them could have foreseen what would come next. Plague-ridden and scorned, the Red Widow Genus had been cast into the jungle to be forgotten. But fate had other plans. After many days in the jungle, Genus emerged. The Pan were humbled, for all signs of plague had been lifted from the young genus, replaced by a regal gait none could deny. Fascinated, all assembled to hear her tale. <laughs> and quite a tale it was. Genus spoke of a vision that had come upon her as she lay in the moss, gasping out her last. In her vision, the plagues had returned. Pan, young and old, wailed and keened and spat their last blood on Yesha's pristine sand. But then, when all seemed lost, a great tree rose out of the jungle, strange and wonderful and heavy with luminous fruit, this tree. The Thane, she named it, gave all who ate of it a life unending. The Pan embraced it, and their glory stretched on for a thousand epochs. Zenus rose to power on this. Mm. The spire built of words. 
by spreading her message of doom and salvation. <laughs> the Red Widows were easy converts, inclined to believe their sister, and eager to spread her vision to all the pan. In time, they held more sway than even the Vaughns. <laughs> it was a great shift. It would not be the last. Among the Red Widow's genus was quickly elevated to Widow Mother. The crops flourished and the villages spread. The jungle receded from the shore. It is difficult to say. Genus has had charge of her own legend for an age of ages. Suffice to say there is enough truth to her vision for me to know her personally. Though I was born some thirty mothers hence, and yet, in knowing her, I find its question impossible to answer. Uh, but we get ahead of ourselves, two-handed one. Many seasons passed, and Genus grew stooped and lined as all Pan before her had. In her 77th winter, Genus had another vision. The Thane called to her, and she told her people it was time to seek it out. For the calamity was imminent. Five hundred Pan were assembled to undertake the expedition. Genus herself, a contingent of Red Widows, a party from each of the villages. Many imagined they would never see their queen again. Those that lived long enough came to know the taste of those words. When Genus, now as young and beautiful as the day she first beat death, emerged from the jungle once more, with 49 immortals at her back, she had been reborn a second time. As an Empress Eternal. For years they searched the forest battling hunger, storms, and beasts red of tooth and claw. Twenty winters passed. Many succumbed to death or to doubt by the 21st spring. Only five Red Widows and 44 common Pan stood at Genus' side. It was they whom she led into the clearing. It was they who beheld the Thane. It was they who tasted the fruit and felt time's weight fall from their shoulders. No plague has touched the Pan since, but Calamity wears faces nearly as numerous as our god of old. Unless I am much mistaken, the Empress lives yet, for no funerary smoke has filled the sky above our ziggurat. <laughs> if the Pan vanish from Yesha's soil, I imagine she will be the last to depart. With death thus leashed, the eternal genus and her immortals brought forth an empire heretofore unknown. Great ziggurats were hewn from the living rock, and at their feet grew great cities lit by arcane magics. Genus' prophecies all came about, save one. <sighs> if only the pan of that epoch had wondered as it does to handed one. What of the great calamity? But none worried. Save a few vaults. The old ways were dying, and the Empress was not. No achievement seemed beyond the reach of the Pan. It was then that the wolf came. Ah, but the story of Yesha is the story of who tastes the fruit of the Thane Tree. Forty-nine immortals begat many more. A deathless aristocracy, they traded favor with the Empress, traded years of life itself like fishmongers at market. 
they called it the Ravager. The very obsidian beast the Vaunts of old had glimpsed and hidden. It sprang from the jungle as sudden as a squall. It made no more than mutton of the bravest warrior. Fear fell like night across the empire. Death roamed Asia. Ravenous death none could tame. There were those who would have seen the beast slain, but the Ravager was never much glimpsed that the Red Doe should not follow. And vice versa, the green things of the jungle sprang from the Red Doe's feet. But on what do green things grow, if not the flesh of departed life? Who knew what would become of the Doe if the Ravager were felled? Who knew what would become of the jungle? Who knew what would become of the Thane Tree? It was the twice humbled Vaughns who kept the Empire from vanishing down the Ravager's throat, for the Vaughns had pondered the beast since it first appeared to them on Yesha's shores. It was they who had learned to listen to Aethir's song. They who learned to appease the Ravager with tribute, with dance, and with music. Balance returned, and the wheel of time rolled on. The song of all living things. It permeates our forest. It whispers in the leaves, throbs in the soil, shines in the sun, babbles in the stream. The Vaughns devote themselves to the song's mystery. They play it to tap its power, as other Pan might use the energy of a crystal or the heat of a flame. Those attuned in prayer hear it strongest. But all may catch its strain from time to time, even a Paxil deck. Who is to say? For that was hardly the last calamity to befall the Pan at Yesha. <sighs> With the Ravager appeased, the Empress dreamed of rule eternal. She should likely have had her wish. But for one thing, the Thane Tree, that of the fruit of immortality, began to die. For many lifetimes her permanence hid this knowledge from all who served her, slave and immortal alike. And why not? She had amassed a great store of fruit, and surely something could be done to save the tree. Why crack the very bedrock of her society? But the tree's decline could not be arrested. Fruit was rationed. Noble lineages withered. We lay there, once prepared for the final death of death, only those immortals who had fallen in battle or by misadventure. Now, we found ourselves winding wizened nobles in sap and muslin by the hundreds. Perhaps what came next was inevitable. Rebellion, insurrection, revolt. This was the fire that was to sweep through Yesha's jungle. For a life of lifetimes, the Eternal Empress had hidden the decline of the Thane Tree. But like the Vaughns of old, had underestimated the power of one young, plague-addled Red Widow. Genus herself failed to foresee the power of one called Navoon. Ah, Navoon was one of her eternity's own guards. How she learned of the rot at the roots of the Thane Tree, I cannot say. I know only that she had no taste for the Empress's deceptions. Navun fled the ziggurat and spread the news far and wide. Her words found home in the ears of the gull. Yesha's slave cast. No slaves could hope to challenge the power of an immortal aristocracy. But what about a nobility in disarray? One where the great and powerful would soon fight for scraps of fruit like bare-ribbed dogs. They rose, 
first singly, then in a tidal wave. The Empress found herself at war. Perhaps she might have won, if not for the Destroyer. Ever was Gina served by the Red Widows. She was still Widow Mother, is still, if such a thing has any meaning now. Some among the Widow's ranks forswore tenderness and became instead her permanence's highest guard. Genus herself had been the lowest widow in her order, and she had turned pan society inside out. How fitting, then, that the last and least of her own widow guard should become her greatest adversary. It bridled when I called it God Murderer. Surprised I am that it should know so little of the deep track its kind have trekked across our soil. Let us walk those prints now, that it should be enlightened. It has heard of Yeshad civil war, of slave with blade of hoe to neck of noble, and noble with point of sword to belly of slave. Into that tempest walked one of its kind, Paxotec. I cannot say why, though perhaps it might someday tell me from whence, well, whatever its motive. Hither came the Destroyer, even as the Pan turned their ravenous gaze toward the fruit of immortality. Our god of many faces remained satisfied with the scant worship of the vaunts and the commoners. It was an ever-present comfort. A guardian we scarcely thought of. The destroyer Paxotec, oh yes, its kind, drove its blade into the pure heart of our guardian. We knew not that it was the god of many faces who kept the root from this world, but in death, many faces' absence was soon felt. In her world already torn by war, where caste let blood of caste, there came reports of some new woe. Travelers spoke of twisted horrors on the road, but we who relished in the weight of this wall only scoffed. Who knew that the very air could rip, that the world itself could tear and spill like a wine skin under hoof. Oh, how we fought, priest and prince and pauper, side by side, our world's lifeblood drizzling through our fingers as we clutched at the hanging tatters of Yesha's slit throat, most perished. And I became enmeshed. I thought our tale told, our race run. And yet, and yet, among the pan there is a saying, why just ask the Rin? I gave the impression, perhaps, that Yesha was uninhabited at the arrival of the Pan. Save for the doe, the wolf, the birds, and the beasts. This is not so. The Rin slink Yesha's canopy on leathery wings. Perhaps they once thought to defend their forest. But Lash and Lure put that to rest. Lash, in that no Rin could hope to withstand the onslaught of energy we Pan have learned to draw from Yesha's native crystal. The Flying Ones have no talent for crystal craft. Lure, in that under normal circumstances, Rin eggs reach maturity only with great difficulty. I know not who first discovered the potential for symbiosis between our species. Uh, only that 
It is a whimsical god indeed who sends the most precious resource one kind could hope to acquire out the hind end of the other. As sure as there is iron in the soil of Yesha, there is irony. <laughs> it was a pad-footed Paxeltec who slew our guardian and brought the root. Would it be so strange to see a Paxeltec drive them from our shores? Perhaps. Perhaps as with Genus and the Voon. The strangeness is the point. It has done me a service unpayable. No reward can suffice. But perhaps, if it cannot be rewarded, it can be equipped. Kolket brought war, then wisdom. Its forebears brought the root, but its wisdom stayed the flames. That I might live beyond the hated knot. Take this now, as a token of my gratitude. The Pan must put their faith in action and belief, not weapons and walls. I forever owe it thanks, as shall the many souls scattered on these steps. To them I must tend. Be well. Two-handed warrior, be Strange Fate's agent. The back. <laughs>